Shalom, everybody. Shalom, Shabbat. Today we are going to talk about, uh, um, consider what I uh, titled Get Godly Wisdom. Get Godly Wisdom. I knew of an incident that happened in the past of a young man who was opportune to stand up and address some group of Christians in a message. And in his message, he made, he made some mistakes by posing the scriptures, but introducing some thinking, some uh, thoughts that are not completely in line with the biblical injunction. And he was promptly corrected for that. And he noticed this, that yes, what has happened is putting God's scripture, his words, but using worldly wisdom in interpreting what he has read from the scriptures. And it completely takes away from the meaning of what the scripture intends. So it comes, uh, we, we then come to see that it is possible for us to read the scripture and yet interpret it using our own human wisdom, which is an error because it will take away from the truth of the Bible. Let's not forget that half truth is no truth. Okay, so um, in discussing that and seeing that, I have looked at, let's, I have decided let's look at what wisdom is all about. So if we use our human or worldly wisdom to interpret God's scriptures, it goes to show that we have two different types of wisdom, godly wisdom and human wisdom, right? But before that, let's look at the definition of wisdom. What do people refer to as wisdom? How do we define wisdom? Wisdom has been defined as the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action based on broad or complete knowledge, that is fact and information, and understanding. So it is the sum total of ability to judge correctly based on knowledge and understanding. That is what people will define wisdom to be. That's what the internet dictionaries will define wisdom to be. But what did the Bible define wisdom to be? The Bible is simpler in its uh, definition. Let's turn to Proverbs 9.10. Proverbs 9.10. And we will see that the definition of wisdom in the Bible is uh, complete. It is simple yet very, very complete and accurate. Proverbs 9.10. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So, the fear of God, whoever has the fear of God is beginning to understand wisdom or to be wise, so to speak. Whoever has the fear of God is beginning to be wise. So it goes to show that fear of God, fear of God goes hand in hand, or as they will say, pari pasu, with gaining wisdom or understanding. Okay? Um, God tells us through the scriptures to seek and get wisdom from him. We are admonished day in day out to seek and get wisdom from God. And it is clear that we don't always have this, his wisdom. We don't always, in all circumstances, have God's wisdom. We are expected to actively, daily, constantly pray to God, asking for his wisdom. Now, let's ask ourselves, how many of us pray daily to ask for God's wisdom? Yes, we ask for the things that we need. We ask that God will protect us, guide us, and all. But do we also ask for God's wisdom? Do we? James 1. Let's turn to James 1. The Bible says that we should ask for God's wisdom. We should pray for it. James. James 1.5. If any of you lacks James 1 verse 5. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, if any of you lacks wisdom, now, who amongst us will say he or she doesn't lack wisdom? You know that the way of man is not the same thing with the way of God. So we are referring to here as, what we are referring to here is godly wisdom, wisdom that we will soon get to read those scriptures to understand that point clearly or clearer. We are honest that we must ask for God's wisdom because it doesn't come naturally, it doesn't come automatically. And it doesn't even come with old age. Someone once said in the past, in one of the literatures I read in the past, that don't always, don't always seek advice or wisdom from old men. Not in all cases. Because foolish men grow old too. And the foolish one that grows old will give foolish advice. The point I'm trying to make is that it's not all old people that are wise. Wisdom has to be sought. We have to ask for it. We, ask to, we have to pray for it. And we have to constantly ask God to provide wisdom. Proverbs 1, Proverbs 4, Rela. Proverbs 4. Let's turn to Proverbs 4, please. Proverbs chapter 4. Let's start from verse 1. Let's take it from verse 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father. Proverbs 4, 1. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. For I give you a good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. This we are referring to here, wisdom that comes directly from God. And it is, who is everybody's father. Who is our heavenly father? It's not God. So he is talking to us here. Of course, we know that this is written by, uh, by Solomon, but it's admonishing to us today. And we should listen to it and take it, take it. Okay, verse 2. For I give you good God doctrine, do not forsake my law. 3. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, let your heart return my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not turn, do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, that is, do not forsake wisdom, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Now, verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in your, all you're getting, get understanding. Okay? That's Proverbs 4, 1 to 7. It goes all the way to 10, but the point, the main point there is that verse 7. Okay, God's wisdom is very important, and it helps us get focused towards attaining or achieving salvation. It is very, very important. It is crucial without which we cannot move at all. We will only rely on our own human wisdom, which we will soon see to be unreliable and that fails and has no connection, has nothing to do with things of God. Second Timothy. Please let's turn to Second Timothy uh, verse chapter three. Verse 15 to 17. This scripture shows an important point on how we can go about our lives as Christians in trying to get wisdom. It is important. It is very, very important. Second Timothy 3, verse 15. And that from childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures. This is Paul talking to Timothy. You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. Now let's notice that from childhood, he has known the scriptures that's helped him.
it is important for the younger ones amongst us to be taught the scriptures. It is very important. And I'll tell you why. The, the things that they hear while they are young sticks better and helps them better in life. I remember one time that uh, myself and one of our brethren here and another person that is not from this congregation were going in the vehicle and then the person started reading a particular psalm and the other lady couldn't believe it and we opened the Bible and then he read it from beginning to the end. When you learn some things when you are young, it sticks. I was a Muslim, I was born a Muslim. I try constantly to take my mind off when I hear Arabic being read. Even after being, uh, I was baptized in 1999, that's 21 years ago. And I've stopped reciting Arabic, but it's still fresh in my mind. Why? Because I grew up with it. When we teach the younger ones scriptures, it sticks in their mind and it helps them, it grows with them, and it becomes a veritable tool to them when they grow old. And as we have seen here, it helps to make, um, to make them wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We need to learn that wisdom, which is usually gotten from the reading scriptures, helps us in planning our lives, in living according to what God wants us to live, the way God wants us to live. So you see that scriptures helps us to be wise and lead to salvation, okay? Now, looking into the scriptures, we see that there are three types. This is, this is another very important point. There are three types of wisdom. And it is important for us to understand it so as to know which to follow and which to avoid. Again, it is important for us to know the type of wisdom that there are, as we have seen in the Bible, so as to know which type of wisdom we should earnestly pursue and the kind of wisdom we should run away from, we should avoid, that leads to death. I'm not going to turn there now, but we will soon read it in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 19, that shows the kind of wisdom of this world. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 20. Okay, and then we have James 3, 14 to 16, which shows the wisdom of Satan. And we have 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 31. And James 3, 13, 17 to 18, which shows the wisdom of God. So we will, go, we will read through these scriptures so that we will understand it clearly what, how they operate and the difference between them. Now let's notice that we've seen now that there is wisdom of man, human or worldly wisdom. And there is wisdom of Satan. And there is wisdom of God or godly wisdom. In discussing this, it is better for us to classify because as far as I'm concerned, human wisdom and Satan, wisdom of Satan are grouped together because they are all worldly wisdom. And they both completely and clearly and absolutely contradict or and it contrast with wisdom that is of God, godly wisdom. So let's look at a few things about the satanic or worldly wisdom so that we understand what it is. I will not be naive and unwittingly flow into it or key into that kind of wisdom. We shall avoid it. It is deadly, it leads to destruction, and it is absolutely antithetical to the God's way of life. Wisdom that is of this world does not come from God. As a matter of fact, it antagonizes godly wisdom and everything that it stands for. Now let's look at this clearly in 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1. 18 to 23. So I will understand <clears throat> that the Bible actually states that there is wisdom that is worldly and satanic. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 23. 
For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who have been saved, it is the power of God. It is clear. The message of the cross, which is death of Jesus Christ, his resurrection, and coming back and being our chief priest, through whom we can key into salvation. It doesn't make sense to people of this world. It doesn't make sense to those who are of this world and are perishing because it doesn't key. It doesn't follow human or worldly logic. It doesn't. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Verse 20. Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Oh, so there is wisdom of this world which God has made foolish. Verse 21. For since the wisdom of God, the worldly, uh, what, that, maybe we should not go into this now because this clearly talks about wisdom of God. Let's jump to uh, James. James 3. But before we read James 3, we should know that man solves his problem his own ways. The ways that appear best to man. The way of this world. Proverbs 14, 12 states that there is a way that seems right to man, but the end is what? It's the way of destruction, the way of death, the way of perdition. It's there in Proverbs 14, 12. So, any way that naturally comes uh, to man as okay, any worldly way, any worldly wisdom is not of God and it leads to death, it leads to falsehood, it leads to deceit. We have rancor, evil, etc., uh, etc., as things that are found in worldly wisdom. Examples, examples are bound. I will use one, just one example, so that I will see that. Human wisdom or worldly wisdom is intended to deceive. It is what some people have termed to be street wise. They will tell you you are not street wise, you are not smart, you are not sharp. You could not put in little to get more for yourself. That's human wisdom. It's worldly wisdom. It doesn't flow in the way of God. A clear example is our current politics, and I will use an example that we are all familiar with. In 2016, the governorship election in the United States, we have two main opposition parties, PDP and APC. And in APC, we have a governorship candidate, candidates that ended up being the governor of the state till today, Governor Basaki, and then under the PDP wing, we have Pastor Ize Yamu. Okay? And then the immediate past governor of this Edo State, then uh, Governor Shomele, came out and sang praises about the Baseki. He is the best person for Edo State. He is, in fact, we cannot trust the so called pastor. He is a cheat, he is this, and called him, he called him so many unprintable names. Reverse, four years later, 2020. 2020. Pastor Ize Yamu has crossed to ABC. And Governor Baseki has crossed to PDP. The two same candidates four years ago, opposite now. The funny thing is this, and the most interesting thing is that the same Mr. Oshomole, Comrade Oshomole, now jumps to the other side, saying, "He said Yamu is the best. In fact, he's a pastor." You see that Joshua, you see that uh, Baseki is nothing. He's, in fact, is a mistake. He's, he has uh, given promises. He has failed. It's interesting how I wonder how the how they see the electorate, the people in the states. Perhaps how they expect them to digest this information. But they will go about every day preaching or stating that 
their party is the best and all that. Okay? That is wisdom of man. It's the wisdom of this world. It is the wisdom of gets in order to deceive people. They have their interest only at heart. They do not have the interest of others. It is selfish. It is evil. It is a worldly wisdom. And it is on the one side of the divide. Now let's look further to understand how it operates. James. Let's turn to the book of James. Book of James, chapter 3. We will see one, some of the characteristics of worldly wisdom. James 3, 14 to 16. He reads, But if you have bitter envy and self seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It is a satanic wisdom. It does not come from God. Oh, so yes, there is a demonic wisdom also as provided, as stated in the Bible. Okay? Verse 16. Let's continue reading verse 16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing is there. Envy, self-seeking. It is just about me, 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 I alone. It's only about me. We dare every evil and confusion exists. It's a way of the world. Let's jump to uh, chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Because it's self-seeking. It is selfish. You lost, verse 2, and do not have. You murder, you covet, and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. All these things, fighting, war, and um, lost, and all that, they are all selfish. Most of the time, it comes, as a matter of fact, all the time comes as a result of selfishness. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful in choosing the kind of wisdom that we key into. We do not want to be seen as arrogant. We do not want to be seen as pompous. We do not want to be heard saying, do you know who I am? It happens a lot. Well, we had last week of someone that was called by a pastor, someone that was called uh, in the banking hall and refused to answer. It was last week. Yeah, I said it before. Of uh, in the banking hall that refused to answer just because they refused to put was it pastor in front of Dickin in front of his name. Just do you know who I am? And it happens a lot. You see people hit each other and then they will pack and they will be like. This one will be like, do you know who I am? The other one will say, do you know who I am? And do you know who I am? So now be countering each other. And then the next thing you see, this one will pick a phone and make calls. And the other one will pick phones and make calls. Something like that happened sometime in the past, somewhere in Ojota. And it was a young man that was driving a car, a Camry, Camry car. And then he was hit by a BRT. Just a little scratch. He came down and started shouting. Ranting, do you know who I am? I will show you who I am. And then because of his arrogance, he caused a lot of traffic on the road. A whole lot of traffic. And there were some people in the traffic who were hurrying somewhere. And then the young man came down also from the car that was stuck behind to see what was going on in the front. As he got there, he realized that it's this man who has decided to get everybody stuck. You know, he just removed his gun and said, what is happening here? Immediately the guy jumped into the car and took off. Immediately. He, jumped, he became sober, he became humble. Immediately. Without saying anything, he just removed the gun and said, what is going on here? Pride, arrogance. I have a PhD. I have MSc, LLM, ONO. <laughs> AI, AID, HIVS. I have all those things. 
to what end? It is all worldly. It is all of this world. It has no uh, connection with things of God. And the funny thing is that with all those earthly, arrogant human wisdom, we can hardly solve our problems. We can hardly solve our problems. We think we are solving it. But if you look at it clearly, the problems are still there. I'll give you another example. Coronavirus. With all the wisdom of this world, the problem remains unsolved. Something that is too small, we cannot see it with our open eye. And humble the entire human race to show us that we are nothing and our wisdom is limited. It is restricted. It is not of God. And it cannot save us. It cannot help us. For us to be saved, for us to be able to key into what God wants for us, what He has planned for us, we need to key into godly wisdom, into His wisdom. We cannot afford to continue with human wisdom. It cannot help us. Let's turn to Colossians, please. Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Starting from verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not, and not according to Christ. This clearly shows that when we have all this philosophy, like we, I'm, I'm sure some of us who have had the opportunity has been taught that philosophy means love of knowledge, fear, failures, and so fear love of knowledge. And we know that the Greeks and people of that uh, uh, era and generation, they pride themselves in understanding these things. Yes, it has helped the humanity a lot, but it is still absolutely nothing compared to godly wisdom. And we see here in first, uh, Colossians 2.8 that uh, it is not according to Christ. It is not according to Christ. We are in Christ. We are according to Christ. And for him, for in him, verse 9, all the fullness of God head bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Jesus Christ is the head of all. Assize God our Father. Okay. Um, now let's look at what is godly wisdom so that we'll understand it better now we know what earthly wisdom looks like its attributes self-seeking arrogant selfish and pompous which we are supposed to avoid because it has nothing uh, in common with christ or with godly wisdom what is godly wisdom or godly wisdom from above proverbs 23 23 Proverbs. Let's turn back to Proverbs 23, 23. It talks about wisdom. Proverbs 23, 23 states, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Now we know what the truth is. John 17, 17. Your word is truth. It states here, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding the truth is the word of god we need to imbibe it we need to buy it we need to actively work for it get it and do not sell it proverbs 4 7. this is just like uh, introduction and then we'll go and read what godly wisdom is proverbs 4 7. proverbs 4 verse 7. wisdom is the principal name therefore get wisdom and all gets in, gets understanding. With, uh, Proverbs 19, 8. The, the scripture about actually, just a couple of them here, to lead the Israelites there. So let's drop down to verse 9. Therefore, give to your servants an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge these great people of yours? Verse 10. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for riches, 
I have not asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to descend justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be no, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. Verse 14. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walks, then I will lengthen your days. Okay? We see that God asked, uh, Solomon asked for God's wisdom. And God gave him both wisdom, riches, power, honor, and everything that he did not ask for. And we also see it in the first thing he did, or some of the first things that he did, of where there are two women who were fighting over um, a child that is alive, and two of them were rejecting the one that is dead, saying, this is my own and this is your own. How he went about it, uh, that's a story for another day. But, well, our, uh, the parents can read it to the children so that they will know that story and they'll be familiar with it. Okay? How Solomon displayed godly wisdom and how it was different. It's in verse 16 to verse 28 of the same of the same uh, 1 Kings 3. So we all know that God's wisdom is from above. It is different from what we know. It is different from, from what we are familiar with. It is not comparable to man's. There's no basis of comparing God's wisdom to man's wisdom. Because he said, my ways as my ways are far away from your ways is the uh, distance between heaven and the earth. God's wisdom is different from human wisdom, and we are meant to seek God's wisdom. Let's go back to First Corinthians one, where we started from. First Corinthians one. First Corinthians chapter one. We'll read from verse twenty-two. Let's start from verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the speaker of this stage? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world like we read earlier? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 22. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, stumbling block and to the Greeks, foolishness. To the Jews, the fact that Christ is crucified and resurrected is a stumbling block to them. They cannot understand it. And then to the Greeks, because they seek for worldly wisdom, they seek for wisdom that is not from God. To them, it is foolishness. So in other words, what is wisdom that is from above to a carnal mind can appear like foolishness because they cannot fathom it. They cannot understand it. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. This is very key. Knowing that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God is very important. So in other words, we need to live our lives in line with the wisdom of God, in line with, with the ways of Jesus Christ. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. When I got converted newly, and there was a particular hymn, and they said that said foolishness of God, I, I found it difficult to accept that. How can you say God is foolish? And then someone pointed it to me in the scripture. I said, the foolishness of God, that's, let's just imagine in our wildest imagination, which is almost impossible for us to pattern, because our wise wisdom in this in this height in its eyes cannot even be close to what we will term or what is termed as foolishness of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Okay, now verse twenty six. Let's continue verse twenty six. Verse 26, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, nor many mighty, 
and not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise because his wisdom is completely in a different scale, cannot be compared with man's wisdom. He has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. What is the reason for this? Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. If people had been called into his fold due to their wisdom, due to how they can decode the Bible and the scriptures, then they will go ahead and with their shoulders high. Yes, I'm, I'm one of the chosen because I'm very good, I'm very smart, I'm very wise. So I can understand the scriptures, these little bit of the scriptures more than anybody else. If that is the case, then most of us here will be professors, perhaps professors of theology. But how many of us here are professors? None. We are only hoping that uh, Mr. Moses Wala will become a professor one day. But even his own professorship, when he gets there, is after he has been called into the fold of God. Okay? That no flesh should glory in his presence, but to him who are in Christ Jesus, verse 30, who become for us wisdom from God. This is the second time Christ is referred to as wisdom from God or wisdom of God. So we know what godly wisdom or wisdom of God is now. Okay? Now I'm going to read verse 30 again. But to him, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay? That it is as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So we need to grasp, understand, study, and acquire wisdom from God by understanding Christ and his righteousness and the sanctification and the fact that he has redeemed us from our worldly wisdom into the godly wisdom that we should seek as Christians. Okay. James, let's go also to James 3. James 3 and uh, verse 13. James 3 verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness of wisdom. Okay? This is another point here. Meekness of wisdom. It goes to show that when you're talking of godly wisdom or wisdom of God, it flows, it works hand in hand with meekness with humility, with understanding, and not with arrogance, not with worldly arrogance, but with meekness. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. Okay, this, this is a worldly wisdom. Okay? Let's jump, jump down to verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. God's wisdom is pure. Then it is peaceable. It is gentle. It is willing to yield. It is full of mercy and good fruits. It is without partiality and without hypocrisy. Okay? Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's look at other scriptures before we look at some of the points that, that are written here. Ephesians 1. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 15 to 19. We are trying to understand the whole idea or the concept of godly wisdom or the wisdom of God and so that we can key into it. Ephesians 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I had... Ephesians 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also... Have I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints? Do not cease to give thanks. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17. And the God of our Father, and that the God of our Father, 
Jesus Christ. Okay. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So we see here that it's only God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that can give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This revelation comes through the knowledge of him. Remember that we started by saying that what wisdom is and what understanding is in the Bible. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? These scriptures makes us understand better what the wisdom of God is all about. We can only understand God's plan for us if we have his ability and wisdom for his truth and revelation by his Holy Spirit, which leads us to knowledge of him that is wisdom, that the wisdom of this world lacks. It is very important for us to understand this. Okay? Now, in James 3.13, let's go back there, we see that one of the things that are important uh, in godly wisdom is meekness. Meekness completely is a complete contrast. It completely contradicts arrogance, pomposity, being self-righteous, being filled of oneself. That's, I have it all, I know it all. Meekness is important for us to key into God's wisdom. We must key into it. Wisdom from God sharply uh, contradicts, uh, contradicts that of the world. Okay? God's wisdom produces righteousness and produces peace. Let's drop down to 17, verse 17 of James 3. Verse 17. For the wisdom of that is from the above is first pure. I, I said we should go back to this again, do it ready before, because let's quickly look at some of the things that are used here. The first one is pure, purity. Clear of any form of uh, death. God's wisdom is pure, it is chaste, it is sanctified, and it is not of this world. God's words are pure, and his ways are pure. And the knowledge that comes from God is pure. First John 1, 5 to 10. Let's read this here. First John 1, verse 5 to 10. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. That God, God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. Okay, let's uh, read the rest uh, by ourselves later. Let's go back to James 1, 16 to 17, because of time. James 1, 16 to 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. There is no any shadow of doubt at all. There is no maybe. There is no as in except this one. It is pure and completely pure and nothing but pure. Okay? We must reflect God's lies and be pure. And if we must understand the wisdom of God, we need to be pure. We need to be peaceable. We need to be meek. Which brings us to the next point. Peaceable. Peaceable. James 3.17. We said, it's first pure, then peaceable. Okay, peaceable is the second one. Gentle is the third one. Willing to yield is the fourth one. And full of mercy and growth is the fifth one. Without partiality and without, without hypocrisy is another one. So what is peaceable wisdom? How do we understand what the uh, Bible refers to as peaceable here in Godly wisdom? It does not contain anger. It does not contain strife. It does not incite strife or intimidation. Wrath. It radiates and gives peace. It radiates and gives peace. So the question is, are we peaceable 
So the question we need to ask ourselves, are we actually feasible? Do we, do we express show of peace? As we see in 1 Corinthians 14.33, we'll have to read that by ourselves. If we want his wisdom, we must have the attitude of peace. We must express peace. We must be peaceable in our words, in our actions. Job, uh, Romans 12.18, James 3.18. We'll see it there. As much as possible, let us live at peace with all men. The next one is gentle. When someone automatically is gentle, it is easy to flow with that kind of person. When someone is aggressive and arrogant, then it is difficult. One will have to muster energy to deal with such a person. But someone that is gentle, peaceable, and kind, meek, humble, is easy to work with and to flow with. I was I was opportunity to see someone who was my lecturer while I was in university two Sundays ago. And I was I was taking him to somewhere and then as he entered my car, I was like, ah, this is a nice car. And I was like, and I told him, Yeah, I knew you when I was in school. You have fancy for good cars. And he said, Yes, you're right. I actually have a Benz, so so and so model, yes, so and so. And I said, Ah, great. So why are you not driving it? And then he told me, he said, that my doctors told me not to drive, so I knew something was wrong. I said, Why? And he said, While he was in, actually, while he was in school, he's this kind of lecturer that likes exerting his authority, he will shout and harass and intimidate just so that people will be afraid of him. So I guess he did not stop and he went to a bank and um, he had issues with his account, and he went to the bank or manager, and he started shouting again. And I started, uh, he was one that told me, he said I started shouting. Suddenly so he just realized that he became faint. He was giving a seat to sit down. He sat down, and then his right hand and leg became numb. He couldn't use it. He couldn't use it, and he started sweating profusely. He actually lost consciousness. They revived him, quickly took him from the place to Lassus. And while he was there, he coughed out 1.2 million naira to treat himself. Gentility is cheap. It saves us stress. It saves us high blood pressure. It saves us all these things that we can afford, we can avoid rather. It is completely different from arrogance, rigidity, pride, stubbornness. God shows that he is gentle and he is at peace with us. And that's why a lot of times people will take his gentility for a ride. Not knowing that or forgetting the fact that God remains God. It doesn't take him anything to take us away. And if you remain arrogant and you refuse to key into God's wisdom, we will see the other side of God. Okay, um, we can also read Matthew 11, 28 to 29 for that. So I'm not going to turn there again because of time. And then the next one is willingness to yield. Willingness to yield. Are we willing to listen? Are we rigid? Or are we approachable? Are we easily entreated? Are we easily entreated? Can we be approached if someone has issues with us? Or do we have this shoulder pad on our shoulders that is so high to the point that someone will have to pray and fast before approaching us to discuss issues with us? We need to be careful. We need to imbibe the spirit of willingness to yield. Okay? Because God himself showed in so many occasions in the Bible, so many instances, that he's willing to yield. You remember when Moses... Uh, when they told Moses that these people they are stiff necked, let me just wipe them away, and then I will raise a generation, another generation through you. And Moses back and said, "Please don't do that." What will the nation say? They will say he brought them to the to the to the desert to to the wilderness to kill them. And what did he do? He yielded. He changed his mind, and he continued with them. Okay, but we need to be careful. 
in our willingness to yield, it must be in the context of godliness. If we are being entreated to do something that is not godly, please, we are not supposed to yield. We cannot, that is worldly wisdom. It is not godly wisdom. Someone will tell you that. Uh, you, you, can, you can, of course, if the conductor doesn't ask for money, just keep it now, after all. It's gain to you. That skill that you are using to sell the fish or whatever, just put, let this one be a little bit heavier and then use it to weigh. It will give, it will lead to more gain to you. To what end? Those things, those physical things will finish. The annoying thing is that it won't even last long before it finishes. But that record is there. In our mind, we are wise. That is worldly wisdom. It is not godly wisdom. We should run away from it. We should pick our true shoes and run. Okay? God's wisdom is full of mercy and good fruits. We see this in Matthew 5, 7. Do we yield good fruits? Are we full of mercy in our actions, in our daily lives? If we are not, then we should know that the supposed wisdom that we have is not of God. We are on the other side of the divide. The next one is without partiality. God's wisdom is without partiality. It should not show partiality. And lastly, it is without hypocrisy. It is without hypocrisy. We, sh we cannot afford to say something and do something else. We cannot afford to, in presence of people, while addressing a lot of people, say, this is what you should do, this is how you should act. And then, while we have ourselves, do something else, or even think of something else in our mind. It is hypocrisy. God doesn't want it. It is not in line with godly wisdom. It is what worldly wisdom will be or will do. So let's conclude by reading Ephesians 8. Ephesians 5, please. Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 8 to 21. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You once had worldly wisdom. Now you know godly wisdom. We need to walk circumspect in line with godly wisdom. For the fruit of the Spirit, verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So do we show goodness in our daily activities, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our speeches, in our relationships, in our characters? Do we show goodness? Do we show righteousness? And do we show the truth? Are we truthful to ourselves? And are we truthful to others? We need to be truthful to ourselves. If we are not truthful to ourselves, how can we be truthful to others? Okay, verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. What is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Not as fools here will say, not as worldly wisdom will dictate, because it is foolish. It is foolishness. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, we do not have time to waste. We do not have time on our side that we can play with because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking, verse 19, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. In our hearts, okay. Verse twenty: Give, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Brethren, 
we have seen today that God wants us to have wisdom. He said, ask. Those of you who don't have wisdom, please ask of me. And I'll give it. James 1. Okay, but we need to understand that there are two types of wisdom. There is worldly wisdom, there is a godly wisdom. Okay? And in our actions, we have seen through this uh, message of today that there are some characteristics that are in worldly wisdom. It is only about self, 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 self alone. And we know also that there is the other one, which is the right one, which is godly wisdom. In our actions, in our thinking, in our activities, we need to decide which side of the divide we want to choose. If we will go along with the worldly wisdom and face the consequences, because of course, there is consequences for it. Or flow with godly wisdom, imbibe the attitude, the culture, the character, understand it, make it a part of us, and reap the benefits, the rewards of living according to godly wisdom.